<laughs> Actually, what Kenny is most famous for definitely is the fact that he is internationally recognized as a hero in cosplay. And it's interesting to go out of the web and just see all the different Kenny Trevelyans that are out there, of which this current version is just one. And you're a very interesting guy. And we're proud of Kenny as one of our graduates here. I should add that at UNSW, we've had on their work about 90 uh, higher degree research programs that have been conducted here. And many of the people who started there telling the logical research here are now spread all over Australia and, and the world. So this has been a very productive area for um, telling the logical research. Okay, um, should I just go through it? Okay. Um, I'm going to present a paper that's kind of weird. Um, I wasn't going to talk about fossils per se, but I did bring one of my favorite little teeth here, Galadon, and we want to see what one of these things looks like, the, uh, the giant shark. And I'm going to consider uh, James Hoff and, and Sue and I have been playing with this idea for a long time about trying to see, is there a potentially more interesting explanation than some of the conventional ones for what actually started the Pleistocene? It's curious, everybody knows what the date is on the, on the chart for when the Pleistocene occurred, but we don't really understand why is that the beginning of the Pleistocene, the end of the Pleistocene. And I'm also going to consider what I think is a correlated issue why did Megalodon go extinct? If it did, so let's play with that for a minute. I have to start you out with this, just to sort of put this in your head as we go on. And Sharknado was brilliant, and I love this summary that's on Rotten Tomatoes. Proudly, shamelessly, and gloriously brainless, Sharknado redefines so bad it's good. And if you haven't seen the movie, you definitely should see it. There are five sequels, so it can't be that bad. And the most recent one um, was actually called Global Swarming. Of course, you know, the, the whole um, idea here is that there were terrible big tornadoes that tore up the ocean, sucked up all these sharks, and then they came stripping into the land and dropped them on everybody. And there are people going inside the sharks with chainsaws to get their loved ones out of the sharks as they're flying. It was a wonderful movie. <laughs> all right. Um, the Pleistocene question. What actually triggered the Pleistocene? We know about the Pleistocene all over the world. For Australia, it was mostly dryness, as opposed to uh, snow and ice. But what was the trigger? What was the tipping point that moved the Pleistocene into the Pleistocene, what we call here a scene changer? If you actually, and I'm sure most people here would be aware that the Pleistocene is generally regarded as the ice age of Superior, when we have a whole lot of mass glaciation in the sequels. And it starts, it triggers at about 2.58. <clears throat> and that's what we wondered. What, where is that figure coming from, this 2.58 um, to 2.6? Why, why is that the base of the Pleistocene? If you actually, and we've had discussions with the, the climate change people, the paleoclimate change people, try to say, well, why is everybody thinking that is the base of the Pleistocene? And they say it's very hard, actually, because like here's a, here's a global temperature curve starting at about, about five, the beginning of the Pliocene, and you can see more or less it's sort of just dropping. You can't see an actual point in which you'd say, oh, well, there's obviously something profound is happening here in order to, uh, to recognize the difference. And, and the difference here is the Pliocene is this side of the line, and the Pliocene is that side. Well, you don't see any obvious for why that would happen. So the paleoclimate people say to us, they're not sure. They're arguing with us about uncertainty about what we're putting forward, but they don't have a better explanation, which is kind of interesting. Okay, the, what we're suggesting is the issue may well have to do with the Alpenin um, asteroid. This was a, a very well-studied um, meteor that came into Earth, and the, uh, we know quite a lot about it. We have published one paper on this already, in which we drew attention to the seemingly extraordinary coincidence between the arrival of this asteroid um, at about the same time when that boundary between the Pliocene and the Pleistocene is globally recognized. And what do we know about this? Well, we know that it came in around 2.5 to 2.6 million years ago, and that's based on dating of fragments. The area of impact between Chile and Antarctica. Uh, the size of the asteroid, this is speculative, based on the spread of part of bits that have been found of the thing. Um, the estimate is two to four kilometers, and that's pretty big. And when you think about the, the chips of the 
maybe what the can in next regard to Rex can. So we're we're in a very significant mountain here that's coming to Earth at about that point. The mega tsunami calculation, uh, when it first when it was first understood to happen, the estimates were well it could have been a kilometer high, some of these tsunamis. It's been kind of scaled down in terms of realism studying what happens when you have impacts in the ocean. And current estimate is about 300 meters high. But that's still like twice the height over the Sydney heads here. You're talking about serious tsunamis uh, emerging from that particular belt. And I should have one of the interesting things about this. This is actually the only known asteroid that actually hit the deep ocean. Probably there were others, but this one is known about. When you consider the oceans are occupying, what, 75% of the Earth's surface, it's, it's improbable that there won't be others. And there may have been more than the one that we know that hit between Chile and Antarctica. It's just that there hasn't been evidence found for it yet. So there's a lot of um, a lot of distance to go here. But suffice to say, this one we do know about. Energy calculations for what this would have involved, essentially, um, it's somewhere between the Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines, which was colossal in 1991. But we know that single eruption dropped all the temperature by a half a degree centigrade and caused dust, and locked out of solar uh, energy coming in. And somewhere between that and the end of the Cretaceous uh, Chicxulub asteroid, which was blocked out some like perhaps a couple of months. So a very serious event. Um, this is another big one. Um, even though it's hitting the ocean, the calculation now is from the material that was recovered. Uh, there would have been a massive increase in sulfur, as well as, of course, water and everything else being punched up into the atmosphere and probably the stratosphere. And that immediately starts to come down, as happened in the Chicxulub. Um, asteroid event, which is now been well studied, as sulfuric acid. So you've got you know, a huge impact coming back into the uh, ecosystems. And uh, this is mostly from James Goff's work. There's no question about it. There are tsunami deposits all over New Zealand. There are tsunami deposits all up and down the west side of South America. And they all are dating at about this point. So we see these things as probably resulting in massive tsunamis that were uh, producing through the oceans. Um, incidentally, the Alpanon is actually named after the ship that first recovered evidence of this meteor. And uh, here it is. So here's, here's um, South America, the Chile coast, Chilean coast, and Antarctica, and that's the impact zone. And fragments are being recovered. Calculation at the moment is 10 kilograms of fragments per meter squared times thousands of kilometers. So you're talking a serious lot of rubbish that came in at that point and exploded. There's not a crater in the bottom of the ocean. Mind you, you're talking about three thousand meters deep here. Um, and that's puzzled people a bit. But of course, if it came in at an oblique angle, it might not have actually had enough force to get it on the ocean. So there's still some uncertainties here. The calculations of what happens to the tsunami when you have this meteor coming in at this point are quite interesting. And essentially, by about um, five hours, you've got this 300 meter tsunami cruising massively up through the whole Pacific Ocean. Uh, James is convinced it actually swept over much of New Zealand, dropping sand deposits on the western side of New Zealand, and certainly calculated uh, lots of deposits here, possibly Antarctica as well. But of course, it's covered in ice now, so getting evidence for that is even harder. Um, okay, there is some evidence. When we start to find out, is, you know, this must have left some kind of a signal in the paleo environment of the world. And if you actually look at sea level uh, changes, there is, right at that point that I've marked there with an arrow, there is a plunge from about five meters below sea level to about 60. So you're talking about a serious drop, sudden drop in sea level at about that time when that meteorite came in. How could that possibly have triggered the Pleistocene? Well, if you have that much sea level that's suddenly being ripped out of the ocean basins, what happened to it? And chances are, if it was that water that was punched up into the atmosphere, this meteorite came in, um, it's got to come down. And when it comes down, you've already got a, a cooling world rapidly. You've got the albedo effect, the albedo effect, the reflection of the sunlight uh, disappearing. So the world is cooling. Chances are all of this water is coming down and accumulating as ice a lot of the adjacent continental areas. Um, and of course, the sulfur thing is, of course, another important thing. Um, you're not only blowing up all that amount of water, you're also blowing up an awful lot of animals out of so the organics and things punched up into the atmosphere, you're going to have a complex series of rubbish. And basically, whatever comes up, as, uh, as of course, that comes down. 
which brings us to uh, Man, it's lovely. I hope everybody's seen it. It's a colossal, wonderful movie. And of course, if you had, uh, if you ask Jason Statham, did it actually go extinct? There's been this debate. You see, John Long weighed into this on, uh, on the conversation because everybody wants to think this gigantic shark is still out there. Um, and maybe that's slightly exaggerated in how big it was, but it was pretty big. It did go extinct. But this is the interesting thing, and I, I sat through a conference at the SVP in the United States, and the woman who was studying this pointed out that this is the last time in which these mega sharks are found in the fossil deposits of the world. But they're not drawing that link. That's extraordinary coincidence. If exactly the time that meteor comes in, these gigantic sharks all around the world suddenly disappear. You have to say, is this potentially a correlated um, couple of events? And you have to ask, well, how could that work? How could this event have wiped out these poor buggers? Well, in essence, we need to know more about shark biology, I guess. If you start dropping a mountain into the place where all these sharks are, um, and they don't have earmuffs and things, can you imagine the shock, what that might do to the swim bladders of fish? And of course, it's in water, so that enormous force wave, the sound, everything, would have shot through all of the oceans. Um, what we do know is that with the demise of these great sharks, all of a sudden, the release, uh, there was a release on the size that whales could get, and, and it correspondingly, right afterwards, we see whales becoming super gigantic. So the whole ecosystem is disturbed theoretically by this event. Okay, and of course, uh, what goes up uh, has also got to come down. And uh, the question is, <laughs> this is why I think. If this is accepted widely, this has got to be the next Hollywood blockbuster. And it should be called uh, Mega Shark Mega, for sure. Um, it is interesting, and it's kind of a footnote that I will put on this whole thing. Just six hours difference, I mean, you know, in terms of the time frame of the universe and the world is spinning, it's just an accident, cosmic accident, that that meteor, that gigantic mountain, hit the South Pacific. Six hours earlier, if it had come it would have built in Africa. And of course, in Africa, at this time, Homo habilis, our first, the first species in our own genus, was doing its thing, it was the beginning of us. And if that meteor had hit that area, who knows? It might not be us sitting here having this conversation, it might be some clever cockroaches. Okay, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Uh, feelings of outrage and indignation, that's the most ridiculous thing you ever heard. <laughs> uh, it comes down to a 